Good evening, everyone. And welcome to our presentation on human resource analytics. And this is all part of your organizational strategy module, right? And so you know that I'm Carvel McCleary. And the only thing I think I can tell you beyond that is that I am in HR and I love analytics. I did engineering, so I have a statistics and maths background, and then I went into HR. So I work as a HR practitioner at Norman Manley Airport, Airports Authority. And I suspect the reason why I am here and not someone else doing this presentation is because in my thesis on the organizational behavior program, I did a lot of uh, statistics and um, modeling, which is structural equation modeling, all right? So I guess that's why I have been invited to speak with you on human resource analytics. Is that so, milady? Or you'll explain to me after. Okay. All right. So how are we going to do it this evening? Clearly, as we are going along, we don't want me to be talking, talking, talking. But at critical moments, you will... And we're not into the sir thing. We say Carvel. Uh, que pasa? Que es esto? Them things. You know, we ask our questions, right? Agree? All right, so we're going to look at human resources analytics. What can you say you have learned as the most important area in this module so far? What have you learned? Most important to you. You learned? You learned to smile. What else? Right. So strategy, implementing strategy to realize the vision and the mission, the strategic objectives of the organization. And what we're saying now is that human resources analytics is clearly a strategy which can be employed or which ought to be employed, which should be employed to actually allow you to reach the strategic objectives. Right. So it's a critical imperative, I would say to actually gain competitive advantage, all right? All right, so this is how we're going to flow. What exactly is HR analytics? Looking at some definitions. And then how exactly did this field arise? Looking at analytics as a strategy and then the benefits of HR analytics. Implementing it, some challenges and some implications, and also what are the features, uh, some examples in Jamaica, particularly from my perspective. All right? We're good? Yes. All right. So, what exactly is HR analytics? So, remember now that this is a social science. In natural science, in physics, we have one definition, and it permeates. It stands up. Nobody is allowed to come with various definitions, but this is social science. So there are various authors who come up with their own definition. So Lawler says, it is a process of using statistical techniques to tie HR practices to organizational performance. You're linking HR practices to organizational performance. You're looking for relationships, right? You're linking them. Bassi says that it is an evidence-based approach to actually getting better decisions in regards to your people. Um, and it has an array of tools and technologies ranging from simple metrics 
all the way up to what is called predictive modeling. So that's what the brethren Bassi is saying. Harris now comes up and he gives a simplistic delivery on it. He says, boy, it is six types of analytical processes for analyzing HR data. Simple. Whilst Marla and Boudreaux comes with an important area now. They say it is an HR practice which is enabled by information technology. And what it will do is establish the business impact and allow you to have data-driven decision making. Now we start, we're doing masters in HR and there are several HR practices. First we have recruitment and selection. What else? Compensation and benefits. Learning and development. Performance management. Eh? Cultural development, all right. But what Marla and Buja is saying is that now we have another HR practice called HR analytics. So what they are saying is that we can actually have a HR function, a HR department, division, which has within it a HR analytics group that does that work. That's where the situation now is. In fact, there are organizations that rather than calling themselves HR, call themselves people operations or the people group, the people division, using the word people, very important. So HR analytics is now being viewed as an HR practice by, by Marler and Boudreaux. Lala says, HR analytics is not HR measures. What is a HR measure? Or metric, sorry. What's a HR metric? We need a guess. Come with a guess, man. What is a HR metric? What, do, what does the word metric mean? Measure. Right. So a HR metric is a? It's a measurement, an outcome. So for example, turnover rate, absenteeism, HR metric. Those, those um, are called HR metrics. So he's saying that, listen, HR analytics is not HR metrics, right? It's not a measure. It is a statistical or a set of statistical techniques and experimental approaches to actually show you the impact of HR activities within an organization. You should understand by now that HR has a cloud over its head, which is to say that, listen, HR is just there. HR doesn't do anything more than give payment to people. HR doesn't have much return on investment. And HR is beaten down within organizations. But what they are saying is that through HR analytics, you can now show the importance of HR. You're getting me? Through HR analytics. Because you can now undertake measurement and be able to demonstrate how HR is impacting the business. But it is not without controversy. Two brethren, Rasmussen and Ulrich, big names, you know, they say, why well, HR analytics is a fad? Fad. And by now, you should know that there are many fads that have come and gone. What's it, what's, give me a fad that came and, and went. One. Come on, man. Remember, we're doing showtime, you know. And showtime is expensive time. Blackberry phones, uh, well, well, that was a technology that came and we used it and it served the purpose because it actually introduced some other smartphones. But when we say a fad, we're talking like something from the management literature. 
Like, you remember this thing was big once, time management, and then another thing that was very big was TQM. Another thing that was very big was re-engineering and right-sizing. You remember those terms? We tend not to be hearing them anymore, but there are some terms that come up and they become very popular and then they die. But they die because they do not add much value. All right? So what Rasmussen and Ulrich is saying is that, listen, HR analytics is just another fad. It's just another new thing that is coming up. And give it time and it will die. And they have some reasons why they are saying that, which we'll get into later. So HR analytics, we soon get, is called people analytics. It's called workforce analytics. It's called talent analytics. But it is not HR metrics. It is not measurement. It is beyond measurement. So HR analytics require HR metrics. Follow me. For you to get to HR analytics, there must be HR metrics. But the two are not the same. All right? So it is what it is, what it is not. It is not metrics. Because metrics are measures of key HR outcomes. And these are related to efficiency, effectiveness. So you're talking about process improvement. So a metric, various metrics exist. You measure them. And what you're trying to do is either reduce costs or improve the speed of the process by measuring those processes. Right? HR analytics is analyzing HR-related data, which has been integrated with other data in the organization, and showing relationships and being able to now make predictions. So for example, we know that marketing provides data. HR on a day-to-day -day business provides data, but we may not be gathering that data. People come into the department, and they ask us for various things. People phone in. So there are transactions. Each transaction creates data. You are, you are keeping information on people's absence and attendance and punctuality. That's data. You're paying people. That's data. People's demographics. Data. So where you live, where you were born, your name, all of that is Data. Agree? Yes. So I'm saying to you that in HR, a lot of data is there and a lot of data is collected on a day-to-day -day basis. But many of us are not capturing, harnessing that data. We're not necessarily doing that unless you have like a human resource management system. You have heard that term before, correct? All right. HRMS. So HR analytics is analyzing HR-related data along with data from other areas of the organization, along also with the external environment. So look at this. In marketing, you have a management system that is helping marketing to operate. You have customer relationship management that does help you with managing your customers. The finance people, they have a management system that deals with payroll and deals with accounting. In HR, there is a management system that deals with HR. So various, as we speak now, where I work at the airport, we're looking to introduce an operations, airport operations and, and um, maintenance system that will help us to handle the maintenance and the operations of the airport. So I'm saying to you, that now will be providing data. So all of these functions within the organization, if you have a management system that is helping you to do the work, then it is capturing all of that data. HR data now, mixed with those data, you can now do HR analytics on it. You can make predictions. You can form, see relationships that exist. You can get insights. 
That's where the magic is now. But for HR analytics to work, you must have ICT involved. It can't go without ICT. Because ICT is going to collect, manipulate the data for you. So and what it is, it is about creating information or knowledge so that you make people-related decisions. You make better decisions. It is always best, rather than going with what we call seat of the pants or your emotion in making a decision, you should make decisions that are grounded in data, in facts, so that you know those decisions are objectives, objective and they stand the test of time. All right? So analytics, HR analytics, it is about linking your HR decisions to business outcomes and your organizational performance. And when you do that, you are maintaining your alignment with the strategy, you are consistent with strategic HR. If you are just focusing on HR alone, which is analyzing HR data alone, then you are not linking it with the business. Because HR alone is not the business. The business is made up of several entities, marketing, customer service, administration, etc., payroll. So you must be linking the various data in a technological system which is able to do statistical analysis so you can get information to make your decisions. I'm speaking to myself up here. You're following me? Yes. All right. All right. So, my working definition is simply this. HR analytics is really the integration of HR data with organizational and environmental data to conduct statistical analyses and modeling for predictive purposes thus informing decision making. And when we use the term modeling, all we mean in a simple, very simplistic way is creating a diagram that shows what is linked to what. And in reality, it is a process which will be operating, a model, right? So let us move into how HR analytics came when it came, and how it came. Relatively new term, relatively new term. So these guys, Marler and Booja, they, had a, they wrote a document, and in that document, they did a comprehensive review of HR analytics. And what they're saying is that it first appeared in 2003, to 2004. By the way, I see some of you writing. You may not write. You need not write. I'll email it to um, system. <laughs> huh? No, no. This is a no. From I've been talking, this is the first time you are giggling and laughing. So, what have I done? are not done. Okay. So, it is a relatively new term. And if you really analyze it, it is what is called big data, the revolution in big data. How many of you have heard that term before? Big data. Yeah. Nobody love the gadget, gadgety, gadgety thingy? Big data. You have never heard the term? You have heard it. What have you heard about big data? Yes. 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 What you get paid? Yes. 
income disparity. Right. Okay. Right. So, big data is the large volume of data, the large, immense. Let's abandon the word large. The immense volume of data, right, that comes about in a business on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, in this world, this modern world, we're not talking about now the shop on Princess Street or King Street. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about like banks that are island-wide. They will be generating a large volume of data and the speed at which that data would be going in and out of that business is extremely fast. And the variety of the data is wide. Different types of data. Variety, volume, velocity. That's big data. The triple V. Volume of data. The velocity of the data. And the variety of the data. So because businesses are now generating that on a day-to-day -day basis, day-to-day -day, you know, basis, you call it big data. It therefore means that you need to have big systems to hold that big data. And the big doesn't necessarily mean physically big, but mean big in memory and processing speed, right? Yes. And this data is both structured and unstructured. So structured from the standpoint that it may have a form, a template, and then you have unstructured, which is not necessarily adhering to a template that was designed. All right? So look at this now. Big data. Black Friday, 2012. I know a lot of you jump, jump off on... Um, JetBlue and, what the next one name? And gone, Miami and um, Sprint. And to New York to catch Black Friday. As I know, you're a Jamaican physically, you know, but your heart is in the U.S. So I know it goes, right? So you jump on your plane and you're gone to catch Black Friday. Walmart, 10 million transactions in four hours on Black Friday. 10 million. We're talking the entire Walmart now, you know, right? We're talking, you know, UPS, United Parcel Service, right? Parcel. 40 million tracking requests from customers on a daily basis, approximately. That is actually captured. That information is captured on a daily basis. So where on God's green earth would you be housing that data? It means, yes, the systems would have transitioned. So we're not talking about small systems anymore. When I went to UTEC, I, I studied, oh, sorry, when I went to CAST. <laughs> My apologies. When I went to CAST, which is now UTEC, and I walk into the place, I saw a massive room with uh, some big, huge computers and you know, massive things. And when I left the college, and that is in the 80s we're talking now, you know. I know it might, you might sound like boys way, 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 way back, but it's the 80s we're talking. When I left the college and went to work at Jamaica Telephone Company, which is now Flow, which went to Lime, which went to Flow. No, which went to TOJ, to Lime, to Flow. K oh, missing cable and wireless, right. When I went there and got my little work, you know, doing your little work and so on, and I am in the engineering section, the first thing I made sure to do is ask them when I started working out, listen, 
do you provide educational assistance? They say, yes. So I say, how does it go? They say, two years you have to spend. So you see, I watch the meter for the two years. And you see, when the meter went two years, I was back at cast, not UTEC, back at cast to do my electronic engineering degree because it was a diploma I'd done first. So you see, when I walk in seven years later, brethren and sistering, those massive beasts of computers were no longer there. Times had changed. People, ne this, wasn't, this never existed in a laptop. But you know, had some things called Unix microcomputers and mini computers and so on. The thing transitioned until today we now have tablets, laptops, smartphones. And in them are some massive memory capacity. And you used to have to have massive rooms of computers. Times have changed, all right? So we're talking about big data. So Mr. Chin on King Street is not producing massive data. We're not talking about a grocery store. We're talking about large establishments that are doing business on a producing transactions on a daily basis, all right? So the second reason we can see for the emergence of HR analytics is simply the, comp the evolution of information and communication technology because the thing has transitioned immensely. Computing power has risen from megahertz into giga. Terror. Memory capacity has shot up gigabytes, terabytes. And then you have virtual memories. You have the cloud. And the cloud is not a place, no, you know. Hey, yeah, but this cloud business is not a place, right, Naki? <laughs> so ICT has evolved significantly so you're able to do mass transactions major computing power it has, and your memory capacity is extremely large. But I'm putting forward to you that another reason why HR analytics has come to the fore is simply because of the competitive nature of business around the world. The competitive nature of business around the world. Customer service is known to be a competitive edge. Why? Because whilst ICT can be seen as a competitive edge, people will catch up. So if I buy, if I buy a system and I'm operating my factory and producing based on that system and running my competitors to a frazzle. They will be trying to figure out what the boy McClear is doing over there and going to do some investigation. Then they say, ah, he has bought so and so. And they, in turn, will go and buy the same thing or buy better because the transition would have been there, the evolution. So then they start hitting me and mashing me up in the market, beating me in the market. So, we can't really have sustainable competitive edge with technology. What we need to do is to rally on the Yeah, man, but who run customer service? The people. So it is a customer service that we need now to be competing with. So you go into a place and by the time you walk in, people start to wow you. Can you imagine walking into somewhere and they call you by name? I go, oh, good morning, Mr. McCleary, so and so, welcome. And you're saying, how on earth did they do this one? You get me? Customer service. So, because of customer service, you can compete. But to compete, you need happy employees. Without happy employees, you can't get that thing called great customer service, you know. These people will give you struggles and trouble, the employees. 
if you're not treating them well. And they now will be giving the customers a bad experience. And then all of a sudden, people say they're not coming back to this business. You know. I refuse not coming here because the people don't treat me right. So you need to fix the people side to fix the customer side. So the competitive nature of business has warranted that we need to find out what makes people tick. How can people be happy at the work so that they are more engaged and productive at the workplace? And HR analytics, HR analytics is one major vehicle that you can utilize. In a simple way, you know that there is something called an employee engagement survey or a job satisfaction. You know those surveys that they put out. The method beyond the madness is that those surveys are to provide critical information to managers so that they can make changes, they can make some adjustment on workplace practices so as to make you feel happy, engage. That's the purpose. So this has given rise to the HR analytics. How can we determine scientifically what will make people be more happy and engaged at work so that they are more productive, so that they talk to people good at the workplace, so that they are so happy with the customers, the customers keep coming back. You can't have a business and when someone calls the business, the person who answers say, yes, well, yeah, me no know, me. It exists. It exists. So you need to be able to determine, to get insights into your data, your HR-related data, your organizational data, the broad data, to be able to make changes to your employee initiatives so that your people are happy. So I'm putting it to you that this is one of the reasons why HR analytics exists. Google, people operations. I found out that, boy, they take the thing to a serious level. You know. They have taken the thing to a serious level. So they have what is called their people operations, which is really their HR department or division. Rene, HR is called people operations, right? So in their people operations, they have a project oxygen. And they do... Surveys, they do interviews, double blind interviews with high performing managers, low performing managers, and they determine what are the best management behaviors, how management must behave with their employees. And having determined this, they then use that in employing people and training people in those management behaviors. But all of this is coming from their HR analytics. All right. Strategy. Work, work. Let us look at analytics as strategy now. The strategy. Okay, it's a strategy. You can implement HR analytics within your organization to be able to meet your strategic objectives because HR analytics is going to be giving you critical information on relationship variables in your various metrics related to each other you can get critical information to be able to inform the strategic planning the strategic management process do you see that all right so we can use analytics to make informed business decisions. Banks, banks, they have been using predictive models for a long time to determine who is risky. So they ask you these questions and you, you, know, you fill up the paper or they interview you and then they say, oh no, 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 later on we can't give you the loan or yes, we'll give you the loan because they plug that into a model which tells them whether or not you are a risk. So there is a predictive modeling taking place, both for consumer and commercial loans. In marketing, they use 
the demographics to predict how consumer will purchase or not purchase, consumer purchasing behaviors, right? Finance have been doing forecasting for years, using sales over time, history, historical sales, along with the time of the year, season. And they can make their forecast into the future. So these predictive models give us an avenue so that we can make educated and informed decisions using data and facts rather than emotion. Now, why should we switch from emotion to data? What is wrong with emotion? It's so it's subjective. Whereas data is objective. And people can wake up in the morning and have a feeling. Boy, I feel a particular way and I make a decision based on that feeling and you throw everything off everything goes into haywire right so we need not seat off the pants thinking nothing with emotion we need to be going through data and facts to be making those decisions finding out clearly how people think think and will act but here is where we have some problems because HR has been slow, very slow, to embrace the analytics field. HR people don't like maths. Why is the other functional areas are busy embracing, caressing mathematics? HR people like to take the step away. Right, Rene? <laughs> I don't hear from Gracie yet. In HR, it is, we do a lot of handling of the soft and the intangible things, right? And we are usually not interested in, as we say, in data and analytics. But it, HR analytics has a power or the potential to revolutionize how we do business in HR. It will revolutionize how we do business. So we now have this wonderful opportunity to disco discover cause and effects that are taking place at the workplace. Yes, my apologies, my lady. Yes. You can. <laughs> right. You can't get a, a, a critical understanding. All right. 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 How would you know if you put somebody there, they are thinking how to do All right, let me give you a simple let me give you a simple example. This is a simple example. So you know about turnover. Turnover is all about you having X amount of people within your organization and within a year. Some leave, so it leaves you with X minus Y. And then you work out the turnover, right? That's a raw turnover. There is something called turnover intention, which is your intention to leave. So if you can determine the intention to leave, then you can probably arrest the person, assuming the person that you want to stay, right? You can arrest the person before they actually turn over. So there is a construct called turnover intention and then there is a raw data of turnover when the person actually leaves come in here you you're inside of this workplace working and you're saying to yourself listen i can do better than this man i'm going elsewhere and you start thinking you start looking for opportunities you then now possess what is called turnover intention you haven't left you know but you start looking 
Now, turnover intention is a variable, a construct. It can be measured. So you do a survey, whether it be a four-item survey or so on, or five items, and you ask people these five things. And if you ask, say, 300 people in the organization, then you have a measure. You have measured turnover intention within that organization because you put it into a, new, a, a number. So that's you now know the turnover intention within the organization, right? You're following me so far? Let us assume that you're looking at the literature on turnover now. And you're saying to yourself, in the literature, it's a boy, you know, turnover intention is based on the trust that exists between management and their employees or between the organization itself and their employees. Or it also says that the amount of respect or the amount of um, overall justice that you get within the organization. All of those terms that I'm calling are measurable terms too. So let us assume you go and you measure those things. Respect, justice, trust, and so on. You know, several variables. But let us also assume that you know the tenure of the people in the organization. So Naki comes in and she's working 10 years in the organization. Grace is working eight years. Renee is working seven years. Everybody has a tenure. But they also have a tenure in the role that they play, in their job. So job tenure is different from the company tenure. So all of those are variables that I'm talking about. So you gather all of that data. Some of the data are data that you don't have to ask the people. Some of the data you ask them. When you have gathered all the data, you put it into SPSS, Statistical Program for Social Science. And in the end, you get a mathematical equation. That now is an equation which says turnover intention is equal to um, trust plus um, role in tenure plus company tenure, that sort of thing, plus gender and so on. That now gives you what is called a multiple regression equation, which you can use for the future to determine turnover intention in people. So you can now say, boy, you know, if people don't trust each other or if they, if they don't trust the supervisor, they are going to want to leave. If they stay too long in a particular job, they are going to want to leave. So what you can now do having gotten that knowledge, is go and create management development programs that target those issues. Telling your supervisors and managers in, in that session, listen, this is what employees are sensitive to, so you need to be judicious in your decision making. You need to be respectful of people. You need to build trust with your employees. So those are the things that you can get. All right? Yes. Yes. Right. Yes.
dedicated your that management was not managing the type of talent you created, you know, the type of talent. And therefore, they did their investigation and created the, the, the data that they needed to make to inform decision about doing HR practice different. And, and Doc spoke about their recruitment program changing because now they were able to identify competencies right. that were required to manage this type of employment that they wanted to do in the organization. Right. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, Myrtle. So if you know what causes X, which is turnover intention, you know the various variables, the metrics that causes turnover intention, then you can manage them. It's not just throwing a party. So if, for example, you know that when people get educational development, they are likely to leave. You know that. Because it is a means of upward mobility. So what do you do? When people get that educational development, then you find something else to give them to do. So they don't stay in a role too long. So they are able to transfer what they have learned in another area of the organization. So you keep them, the talented people. So I'm saying to you, if we don't embrace HR analytics, we don't like the maths, we hate maths, we run from maths, so there's a competency gap, but everything can be learned. That's why you're here learning now. All things can be learned. But if we don't embrace it, then this is what others will. And take it away from us. And go do the work. Alright. So, benefits. We have spoken about executing the business strategy. Right? So we can actually inform the strategic planning process with the information that we have gleaned from our conduct in the analytics. We are able to respond to the demands of the business and we are able to help in improving organizational performance. Certainly, it is a source of competitive advantage for us. But remember an important thing. The, the, the technology, can be, you can catch up. Your competitors can catch up on the technology. But it is the people that is going to make the difference. And it is the data that tells you about the people that will help you to keep the people. All right? So as HR, no, we can be, truly be held accountable because that is one of the controversial things in the HR business. HR will say, how oh, can you hold me accountable when I do not have the power? But I'm saying to you, no, HR has the power through analytics because HR now is able to say what will make X occur or not Y. All right? We now have that power. So we, as HR executives, we can now quantify the impact that we are making on the business through HR analytics. And we are now able to, to shift funds from the wrong employee initiatives to another set of initiatives that we have gleaned from the data, from the objective data. And we should be able to abandon whatever fad that exists that is saying that this will cause us to have happier engage. We are not going with the emotional thing. Because you know these management consultants, they love to rush to come out. And they preach a gospel. The gospel of the consultant. Consultants are good enough. We're not saying that they're not good. But they'll preach a gospel. And the gospel may not be the right gospel for that particular environment and it doesn't work but through your analytics you are able to create 
your information that is relevant to your situation. <clears throat> so why HR analytics, the benefits? We are saying we can measure, we can manage, we can see the relationship of the business objectives and the pe people strategy, right? It's linked. Performance is improved. Return on investment can be calculated easily. All right, so how do we go about implementing this within an organization? Implementing it. Zach Thomas, I've called it the Zach Thomas model. Master Zach is saying six things. Six things. One, within the organization, this is what HR must be pushing now. You need to locate the data sources. What do I mean by that? Locating the data sources. All right. Remember I spoke about HR being a source of data, marketing being a source of data, the other departments, because transactions are taking place in all departments. So you need to locate the data sources, right? You are doing an inventory of the data sources. And then we need to determine how these data can be integrated what sort of statistical focus we will have, which we're going to talk about, choosing a technological strategy, looking at the presentation format that we're going to use to disseminate the information to all and sundry, and having a flexible mind. So let us look at locating data sources. So as we say, all functions within the company, the departments, they are producing information. Whether you know it or not, it is happening. Whether you're harnessing it or not, data is being produced. A lot of data on a daily basis. HR data, marketing, payroll, customer service, organizational performance data being generated on a daily basis. Then we're saying all of this data from the separate, disparate sources must be integrated. So you need something, some technology, some system to do the integration and to hold it in a, what is called a warehouse. Not like Mr. Ray and every warehouse now, right? But in, in memory, right? So it's on a computer system. So we're talking about data warehousing, integrating the data, having it in a data warehouse. Ah, big words now, business intelligence. Yes, man. So it can be in a business intelligence system. But what we also now need to do, which is the third thing they are saying, is that we need to determine what sort of statistical focus are we going to give to that data. Are you going to do descriptive analysis, predictive analysis, or prescriptive analysis? I call it the DPP. Are you going descriptive? Are you going predictive? Or are you doing prescriptive? So descriptive is the simple calculation. Those metrics that we're talking about, those standard HR metrics, absenteeism, turnover rate, Mondays per employee, all of those are just statistical metrics, simple data. They are backward looking. They are in the past. They happened and you measure, you, you, you calculate what they were. At this moment in time, they may not be that because you you're looking back. Because when you're measuring turnover today you know, or absenteeism today, things are happening at the same time, right? So these descriptive statistics are backward looking. 
and they are looking at cost reductions and how you can improve process. And you hear about scorecards and dashboards. They are looking in the past. They are metrics, HR metrics. But this is a principal argument. They are the foundation of you getting to analytics. So before you can do analytic, analytical work, you must have your metrics, right? There you go. So it's dependent. So that is the descriptive statistics. So you need to determine what sort of stats will be done with the system. Predictive statistics is looking in the future. So when my sister over here, when she spoke about, when she asked me the question and I told her about a turnover intention, I told her that there was no a mathematical equation which said turnover intention is equal to X plus Y plus Z plus P plus Q. All of those were metrics. So when I have this equation now, I can now predict what is going to happen in the future. Because I know that if role tenure is high, it will increase turnover intention. Right? So you're forward looking, looking into the future, and you're using historical and present data to make predictions on your future. So you're talking about multiple regression. You're talking about analysis of variance. You're talking about structural equation modeling, data mining, and you spoke about data mining. And then there's something that we're gonna talk about later, which is a little bit, you might find it a little bit terrifying, but we're gonna to touch it a little, called sentiment analysis, right? Prescriptive statistics now is going beyond the predictive and is saying what if so it generates different scenarios using that same model or mathematical equation what if we did x what if we did y so you now have different scenarios and you can choose a scenario and you can so you have different alternatives so you can now pick the best alternative that's a prescriptive. But you need the predictive to have the prescriptive. And for you to have the predictive, you need the descriptive. So some organizations may just do descriptive and predictive, whereas some may do descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. Right? So let's back up. So we said locate data source, do an inventory of all the data that you have, know all of the metrics that exist, where they exist, which department, what is being generated. Determine how you can integrate data warehousing, some technology, and then saying what statistical focus are you going to have. Is it descriptive alone, which is not going to give you much bang for your buck, but it must be descriptive plus at least predictive and you can go into prescriptive, all right? So we are here. But we now need to choose a technological strategy to carry this through. So my lady over there mentioned business intelligence. There is also enterprise resource planning. And you guys would have done the Mr. Um, Golding's program already, right? No. Or is that, is that a different group? That's okay. First, you're brand new. Brand new. <laughs> so you know about like Oracle and SAP? Have you heard those terms? Oracle and SAP? Right. IT stuff, yes, but it's very important. Listen to me. I'll give you a story. I used to teach up here inside this program once, a few years ago. And I taught a subject called information technology in HR. And I put it to you, every class, religiously, some, not a gentleman, no, some lady would say, sir, sir, what do I do this for? And I would say, but you need to know about processes, because we'll be using some software to simulate processes within an organization. And 
the class would always be wondering, why are we studying about process management? Because we are HR people. Why are we doing process management? But you need to know how your organization functions, right? So business intelligence is one. Enterprise resource planning is another. Or e advocate best of the breed talent management technology, um, like Workscape, something called uh, a product called Workscape. We also should choose how we are going to give the information. When we do our analysis, how are we going to present the information? A picture is worth 10,000 words. We have to increase it now, like how technology ramp up everything, right? So a picture is worth 10,000 words. So there is some, a concept now called data visualization, where you visualize the data so you're seeing charts and graphs, but graphs like looking in a three-dimensional way. So that now provides the organization with a different view of the output rather than just straight, complex-looking information. So you're using text and you're using visualization to present the information. Additionally, the HR practitioner who is doing analytics must now be flexible to change. Because whereas in one particular time, we needed to be looking at this, these analytics. But in another two years or one year, the environment would have shifted. And therefore, we know to be looking at other analytics. So we can't say, boy, management don't know what they're doing. They used to tell us to look at this. Now all of a sudden we need to look at that. It is the environment that has changed. And therefore you need to respond to the environment. And you not only need to respond to the environment. You need to look and see what is coming. Then you, in other words, don't wait until the change comes, then you move. For example, if you are sitting somewhere, Sitting down, and all of a sudden you see animals take off. You should take off too. Right? Because animals usually know what is coming before you do. At, the, at another conference, uh, well, at a conference called Impact 2030, uh, they put out another model as to how you could implement HR analytics. They say, listen, you need to understand the difference between metrics and analytics. First thing, boom. Second thing, make sure that you confer with your business leaders. Make sure that you speak with your business leaders because they are able to tell you what are the challenges, what are the major organizational issues happening so that you are able to now use that information as a means of working your analytics. Thirdly, you should align or create HR um, analytics definitions. So all analytics that you are going to produce, you should know the definition. You should have a book with the definitions written down. I remember you have to start from HR metrics. So turnover intention, define it. Turnover, yeah, there are more than one ways to measure turnover. You need to agree what is the way it is being done within the organization. It is defined. And whatever mathematical process you are going to use, it should be within a book. It should be codified. So you're, you're standardizing. It can be drawn on easily. And then you should build a diverse team of persons. So you must have an analyst because you're going to say, boy, you know, I don't like this math business. I need somebody who is an analyst. So you're going to be importing somebody into HR who is analytically minded. Right, Nakisa? Then, <laughs> then, then, you're going to find someone who has consultancy experience because 
someone with consultancy experience are able, they are able to navigate the ins and outs of the corporate um, convincing senior management because they have that experience. So you need people with that experience on your team. So you need analysts, you need the HR person, critical, the consultant, people with consultancy experience, right? Consulting experience. And make the HR data easy to consume. Do not confuse people. Pictures are very important. Visualization, right? So this is where where we have problems now. You notice this. This is descriptive information, descriptive statistics, predictive, prescriptive. So it goes up. Business intelligence and analytics. So let's put it in a picture for you. Say you have bought a human resource management system, which is going to be harnessing your HR data. And on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, information on leave is being produced because people are applying for leave. So you have information on leave. Um, information exists on their demographics. Information exists on their compensation. Right? Uh, what else? Performance, information, but disciplinary information also exists, right? So all of that is gathered as transactions within the HR MS. So you have that. And then you have information from marketing, your promotions and so on. You have information from engineering, what was fixed, who fixed what within the organization and so on and going right around the organization. So you now have one technology that is now to sit on top of all of that information, those discrete data from all of those functions, HR, marketing, engineer, and so on, one technology. And that technology is going to be integrating all of that data, massaging, manipulating that data. So it could be business intelligence, but there is predictive analytics, which is beyond business intelligence. All right? So let us look at challenges now. This is our struggle, number one. Number one is our struggle. How do we bridge this gap? Training, 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 very important, but we also must be willing, we must be open, no, willing, be open to venture out, we have to be willing to venture out into this new world, to embrace this new world. You remember Hema Ha? From who moved my cheese? You remember them? One man, yes, those rats. I can't say one man. One rat was willing to venture out to go look for cheese. So what it really means is that we need to agree to change our mental models. What is it that we would do if we were not afraid? There are many things you and I would do if we were not afraid. You know. Isn't that true? Yes. There are many things we would take on in life. We would be risky. But for the most part, we are risk averse. There are many things that we would tackle. 
So I'm saying the HR practitioner lacks competencies in analytical skills. And we need now to agree that we must get those skills. I give you another example. My examples are not bar examples, you know, they are real life examples, right? So when I went to that wonderful place called Cast, now UTEC, I hated statistics. I loved maths, but I hated statistics. Now, anybody who does engineering knows that engineering is raw mathematics, advanced mathematics. Every subject that you do, it is advanced mathematics. But I'll be lapping up the mathematics. But when it came on to statistics, man, I hated that thing. The other thing I noticed about myself was that I would pass my computer um, subjects, but I wasn't really into it. And, those, and I sat back and I said to myself, you know, I need to address this matter. And what did I do? Tell me. What did Carvel do? Yeah, I changed the mindset. And then what else? I went and bought two books and decided that I am going to do what is called self-directed learning. And I took a stats book and read it. I can't say cover to cover, I must admit, because, but I read a lot of it. But by the time I started reading and understanding what was happening, I said, but is this I mean? And the same thing you did with computers. And sometimes it is the, the leader or the teacher who would allow you not to like a subject. And you have some teachers who make you don't like a subject, right? But it's me, you, you guys behave yourself. So I'm saying to you now, you can do your own self-directed learning to understand the thing, right? So you buy a book and you read the book. And I'm saying to you, you need to take this journey because if we don't do it, others will do it. The finance people are mathematically based. The ICT people, mathematically based. The engineers, mathematically based. And what we will end up with is people taking on a system, taking on the HR data, manipulating the HR data, coming up with results that we did not inform. We who went to University of the West Indies, masters in HRD. So that information has not informed the predictive model, the statistics that is being generated. It is the finance, the ICT, that have created the model. And it can now create untold sorrows in the workplace based on that model. Because HR, who knows the thing, who understands how things work, HR matters. HR has not informed that process. All right. So we're saying, less than 30% of analytics professionals reported having competency in advanced multivariate statistics. This is US information, not in Jamaica. I can't tell you what is in Jamaica, right? And Bassey is predicting that HR functions will inevitably cede responsibility. You know, when a, a king secedes from the, the throne, <laughs> he, gi he gives up. I no longer wish to rule this country. I'm gone. I'm going to marry someone because you want me to marry a particular person. I'm not into it. I'm, I'm gone. I'm leaving the throne. So we have ceded our responsibility for analytics to IT and to finance. Ooh, because we are void of analytical and business skills. That's where we are heading if we do not take the challenge of learning data analytics, HR analytics. So 
operational and financial managers with limited patience for HR or the understanding of HR create people problems, they will do it if HR is not involved in the analysis. Sounds pra practical, possible? So predictive models may be created based on false and flawed assumptions because we are not a part of the process. And you are here studying masters in HR to get that information. So managerial buy-in. <laughs> Big one. So remember, no, you know, we're on to challenges and implications, right? Challenges and implications, right? So we're looking now at managerial buy-in. Politics, politics, politics. Organizational politics. Organizational politics. Now we know that we need to gain access to the cross-functional data, right? Agree? But to gain access to the cross-functional data, we need not to have silos. And you know, in organizations, there are many silos. And if you can have an organization that realizes that silos must be broken down, then you won't have this problem. But let us assume that you have silos. So to get this cross-functional data can be challenging to perform our, anal an our analyses, right? So the managers, the keepers of that information, the exchequers, must be willing to share the data. So it means that we need to develop what? Partnerships. We need to develop relationships with the managers of the other data. Agree? So we need to build credibility and partnership among senior managers so that we are able to gather the data, to be a part of it. So that when the results come back, they are a part of the process. So if the result is even damning or negative, they would have been a part of the journey. So they will believe the results that are provided. Are you working with me? So politics is a big challenge in actually getting this off the ground. Big challenge. Some people may say, why should you be focusing on data? Your HR. You're into touchy-feely, softy, intangible things. Huh? They will say that. But you are, an, you, you are part of an entity that is contributing to the growth of the organization. And you have critical information to provide to the process. And you want to be able to show the predictive relationships that exist. The presence and quality of human resource management systems. If you do not have a human resource management system that is capturing data, storing it, then you can't have data analytics. Or it is extremely hard to have it. Because everything will be manual, manual, manual. And then there, there are some systems that are called talent management systems. They are not providing you with the ability to do statistical analysis. What they provide you with are some predetermined queries. And you use those predetermined queries. You know, you're asking questions of the system, but they are predetermined. So you can't independently do mathematical or statistical analysis. But we mentioned the technology that you must place on top of HR 
and on top of the other systems in the organization. IBM has a wonderful product <coughs> that we are going to be looking at tomorrow. <coughs> and when I say we, I'm speaking about me <laughs> along with some persons within my organization, not we, right? And then, so this does predictive analytics and modeling. And later on, you're going to learn about SPSS because this is just your first course, but you need to, you're going to be doing research methods. And I think you do a program on a module on stats, if my memory serves me correctly. Yeah. And you're going to be introduced to the wonderful world of statistical program for social science. Yes. So what happened is, um, I'm trying to remember the story of IBM. IBM never initially had SPSS, but they bought it. What organizations like these do is they find the best things that are all their products, and they buy them and then own them. <clears throat> so Modeler wasn't their product first. I think it was called Clementine, and they bought it. Um, they bought SPSS, and they know SPSS, SPSS is one of their flagship products. No. Very, 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 very good at doing analyses, various forms of analysis. They also have another product called Amos, which does structural equation modeling, which allows you to draw um, graphical representation of relationships, how metrics are related. So rather than doing the mathematics, you are doing pictorial representation of relationships. <coughs> So I'm saying to you, this is what you'll be putting on top of the data from the various departments to be able to do your predictive analytics. <clears throat> so we, we're going to give you a little <clears throat> experience of what our, we're going to give you a little e example of what our experience, I'm mixing up my exits. That was a joke, you know, mixing up my exes. Right. All right. <laughs> All right. So, <clears throat> at AAJ, what is AAJ? Right. And what is NMIA? Right. So, at Airports Authority of Jamaica, we have established in HR a data analytics and technology unit. And the lady who is sitting there beside Renee, you know her? The lady who is, this little green thing is on, she. That's Nakisa Hansen. So she is a data analyst, right? So this happened a few years ago, but we are at the nascent stage of development. We're just being born, right? So we, but we're doing some work. The other lady now who is sitting to her left in the yellow, see her there? That's Grace Han. No, it's not Han. It's Grace Ann Howell. There's no H on the A. Grace Ann Howell. So she's the HR coordinator but she actively works on technological stuff, right? So they, these two ladies are out. Like him, which one was, was willing to take that step? It was him or her? It was him. It was her? Whichever one. The brave one. So they are now out there, right? So what have we done so far? We have researched some technologies and to date, we know, even today we were at a meeting. Today we, are, we have a time and attendance system that is running that we are responsible for in HR, right? So it's finger base, fingerprint, yep, and that signs you in. And Nakisa is responsible for that system, right? She's a system administrator. We now have a human resource management system that Grayson is responsible for, right? Uh, from a company, and we are going to be 
<coughs> putting it to the releasing it to the um, company in January. The time and attendance will be released in November, right? So HRMS will be released to the organization. So they'll be able to, uh, people will be able to apply for leave. You'll be able to do your performance management system online and so on, right? We have now tackled a learning management system. So we have brought in a consultant, and that consultant taught us how to do online learning. Because we are saying that there are programs that we can put online so employees can actually do it. So for example, we do a security awareness uh, training. Because clearly if you are at the airport working, you need to be security conscious. And to date, we have that program now in a video format. So it used to be stand-up comedy before, but now it's video. And we are going to be putting it on a learning management system. We also have a task management system <clears throat> where you can now put a team of persons who are people who are working in a team and you're assigning tasks and they know, know what are the various tasks that they have to perform and you track the task through this task management system. So those are some of the ICT projects that we have worked on and are working on, right? But let me give you a story on this now. So this is in the area of technology, right? This now, performance management, is in the data analytics area. We introduce performance management. And in performance management, there are usually two major areas, right? There's the objectives that you set, and then there are the behaviors that you are scoring. So people are given objectives for the year. And the objectives are smart. You are to complete a particular task. So if you complete it, you have met the objectives. If you don't complete it, you have not met it. So that aspect of the performance management system is highly objective. You either have met your objective or you haven't met your objective. Agree? So it's highly objective. On the behavior side now, it is more subjective. How is your customer service skills? Is it, oh, teamwork. You're graded on teamwork. What else? Initiative. What are you saying, Ren? Attendance and punctuality is more objective, right? But <clears throat> so you're measured on behaviors and measured on raw objectives. Agree? So we introduce a performance management system. And the system has been running. What we notice, however, is this. When you now introduce incentive into the performance management system. If the incentive, if people are just getting the incentive without any qualification, for example, if it is just that if you score over 50, you get an incentive. An incentive is like 2.5%, right? On your basic. That's a government arrangement. If you if the base is 50%, then the large mass of employees would be scoring over 50. Agree? Now, when we do the multiple regression now, so we're going into analytics. So we say performance equal, meaning employee performance is equal to, and we say it is equal to objectives plus all of those behaviors, behavior one, behavior two, behavior one, whether it is customer service orientation, behavior two is cost, whatever they are. Behavior one, two, three, and there are about, uh, probably about 19 of them. So when you do the regression in SPSS, you get a beautiful multiple regression equation. Analytics. And you can do a bell curve of the scores and so on. So put that aside a little now and take up this. 
we then introduced into the performance management system a 75% threshold. So you move from 50 to 75%. And you say if you score over 75%, then that's when you're getting the 2.5%. What did we find now when we did the regression? Huh? Well, yes, less people got incentive, but not much less. But less people got incentive. But what did we find? What else happened? There were what? All right. Let me help you. What happened when it went to 75%? When you did the SPSS regression, there, were, there was no relationship anymore. Employee performance wasn't equal to anything, meaning you couldn't find what it was related to. Because what was happening is that there was no, no relationship being shown with performance in terms of those behaviors. So there was an assumption that it could be when you raise it to 75%, managers were now not scoring properly. Prior to that, they were scoring properly. But when it went to 75%, they were no longer scoring properly. Because you know in performance management, you have bias. You're going to study about that when you do that module, right? There is bias. Various forms of biases. And therefore, we are now saying that bias was now introduced into the system. So the solution that we put forward is rather than using 75%, then what you ought to do is come back down to the 50% and have a graduated system. 50%, you get X percent. Um, 60% or 65%, you get another um, percent. 75%, you get another. And you, so you have a graduated scale. Rather than saying it is only at 75%. Now I'm saying this is information that we have gleaned through analysis. Analysis. So this is an example of some information that analytics can actually provide to you so that you can now make changes within the system. All right? Yes. No, because we haven't introduced a system. Because it's not as easy introducing, you know, when within the public sector, right, within the public sector, there is just one system. So for you to transition to a graded system, it takes some, some requests, some requests. But the wellness center, we have, a, we have now a wellness center, which is a center that we have built to allow you to do exercise. Okay, you know, the wellness movement is rich, and we are trying to see how best we can keep people healthy and so on, so that they can be more productive. But has the gym made an impact on people's health? At this point in time, we can't say. We can't say. But, but it is possible that we could have that determination by doing probably a double blind, double blind study. People who use a gym versus people who don't use a gym. I use analysis of variance between the two groups to determine if there is a difference between the two groups. <coughs> Those are some of the things you are going to study when you do your statistical or your research methods. Looking at differences between two groups. That now would not be an experiment, but it would be what is called a quasi-experiment. But that you can actually do. We have not done that yet. <coughs> Where we are now, we are actively at AAJ looking at business intelligence software to determine what will be bought for the organization. 
and predictive analytics software. And we are also looking at purchasing some operations and engineering software. So like tomorrow, Nakisa is going to Montego Bay along with the operations and engineering people because Montego Bay Airport has that system. Tomorrow, I'll be going to the Jamaica Conference Center because there is a computer society conference happening there. And the IBM SPSS modeler um, consultant will be in town, so he'll be meeting with us to actually show us what can be done with the SPSS modeler. All right? So those are our experiences that we have had so far in the data analytics and technology realm. All right, within HR. <clears throat> In terms of Jamaica, I know that Ermage runs a HR analytics for business strategy and growth workshop. And then there is also the Commonwealth Human Resources and ICT Forum that was held in Jamaica in 2016 and it's now in Trinidad and Tobago for 2017. And in May 4 to 5, Ermaj did HR analytics for strategic decision making. All right? And of course, the Computer Society Conference is happening now. So, and they are big on data analytics in that conference. Right? So those are the things that are happening within Jamaica from the analytics standpoint. <clears throat> but analytics, there are data analysts working within these entities, banks, building societies, um, utilities, uh, research companies, heavy data analysis taking place there. So people are employed as data analysts. <coughs> are we, this is where we, we end tonight. This is where we end, which we call the future. There is a thing called survey. That survey thing. We do it in organizations because we want to determine people's feelings on matters, right? So it's called perception studies. But these surveys have a challenge <clears throat> because there are some biases that take place. And one of them is what is called social desirability. You answer a question because you feel that is what I want you to say. <clears throat> you know about it, my sister? Tell us about it. <laughs> eh? So the social desirability. You are answering a question within the survey. With, on the questionnaire in a particular way. So it's not an honest response. No, that one. That one. Right. How you wish to be seen. <clears throat> and so there are some ways that you get around that. <clears throat> so for example, rather than it being a face-to-face -face survey, you can do it electronic. Because sometimes when you gather people up in a room and you dish it out, dish out the questionnaire, say, okay, now, answer the question, then that problem exists. So you can get around it by doing it electronically. Online, survey, monkey, and those things, yes. Well, you get away from the social desirability problem with the, with the um, online, but there are some other problems that still creep up um, on, with the online. So there are several biases that are errors that come in uh, with, with um, surveys. The other thing is that it is only looking, it takes a snapshot of the past. A survey is not looking on the future. No. It is looking at what has happened. A snapshot of the past.
passed. <clears throat> it's a self-report, snapshot of the past. Are people being honest in the self-report? So methodologists who create surveys have to do a lot of accounting for the different biases. So they have to design in a particular way the surveys and the questionnaire in a particular way to minimize the biases and the errors. <clears throat> so here we are in, to, this year is when? For the whole year is 2017. Next year will be 2018. <clears throat> now, we are now in what I call the land of Star Trek or the time of Star Trek. Do you used to watch Star Trek? Where you had the beam me up and beam me down technology. And you were wondering if those things were you know, Mr. Spock and Data and Klingons and you don't watch movies and so on. Eh? No man, you guys live in a dull life, man. Eh? <clears throat> <laughs> so, listen to me now. The, the times that we are living in, I call it the Star Trek times. It's few things that can't be done. Few things. <clears throat> you go on a website and you're going to do a purchase. You may not even be purchasing. You just go on the website and start clicking. And the next day, you get information in regards to some stuff. And you say, what is happening here? But there are analytics working in, in the background on the websites, tracking you, measuring you, and making a decision as to who you are, what you would be interested in. It builds a representation of who you are. <clears throat> And therefore, start targeting you with emails or with your web page, with your ads, on your web page, on the ads. Yes. There you go. There you go. So that is where we are. That's where we are. So it is, it is these predictive models that have allowed that to happen. So picture this now. We are now in the land of dynamic observation. <clears throat> because dynamic observation, surveys are still important to know. They are traditional and critical, still important. But we can now go beyond the surveys. Because surveys was begging you, boy, we're begging you to answer the question. We literally drag you into the room, sit you down, or we preach to you and beg you to go on a link to complete the questionnaire. We beg you. We plead with you. No, we do not have to do that because we are in the times of dynamic observation Star Trek. So what do we do? And how ethical it may be now. So we have some, you soon learn about ethics. I think the lady who comes after is the ethics lady, right? And leadership. So when someone is monitoring your email and determining what mood you are in today, sentiment analysis, that's a new thing which comes because of the tremendous power of computers. So you are now able, you are now able to look at emails that are going across the organization. <clears throat> and from those emails, you can now determine engagement, satisfaction with your job, possibility of turnover, turnover intention. That's where the game has gone. Dynamic observation. You can do textual analysis of emails, video, audio. There are social collaboration tools that some companies have <clears throat> where 
there's a team of persons working on a project. They are collaborating. So they, they are constantly sending chat in the chat room and they're sending information. That chat, which is a massive amount of data, is examined. So social collaboration tools is the cousin, brother or sister, whichever one, the relative of social media tools. So remember, we started with this entertainment called social media, no, Facebook, right? And you, but it's for your own personal entertainment and you, I, you take your picture of food and the strangest of things you do and you post it and you write texts and so on. You're corresponding. <clears throat> but then there is a social collaboration tool which is the same principle but now based on we're doing serious work. We're working on a project. Same technology, but it is used in a different way. And you can now harness the information on the chat to determine what is happening with your organization. From that, you can make decisions. Sentiment analysis. That's where we are. Sounds frightening? Well, is that euphemism for spying? <clears throat> And then today, well, is it today? We heard about the Department of Homeland Security in the U.S. that monitors that are that can or is monitoring social media and also your website um, searches to make a decision. Right. So those are things that are happening. So. <clears throat> That's one of, the, one of the things you can raise in the ethics module or the, with the ethics um, teacher, lecturer, as to whether or not it is ethical to do so if you tell your employees that you are doing so. Rene, if you tell them. <laughs> eh? No, 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 no. We don't have the technology. You get me? Is it ethical? If we say to you that a camera is here recording you, is that a problem? Or if you, if you don't know, then it's a problem. Right. So, it is on that note that I leave you. I leave you with the future, where we are. The future, right? And I leave you with that question for the ethics lecturer who will be coming shortly. So you can all speak with her and make that determination. All right? Thanks for having me. data. this particular time because there are some major changes happening in the world that I'm not certain if we here, if we are actually tracking them. So in the United States, we are aware that they, they are now returning to the traditional industries, like the coal um, and the pushing the, 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 the oil and so on, right? 
But the other side of the world is going in another direction. The other side of the world is abandoning those sort of industries and are moving into the more alternative energies and so on. And are also now embracing <coughs> what is called artificial intelligence. With the artificial intelligence, you're moving into a system where you can open a factory to produce products, whatever those products are. And you do not need an individual, or if you do have someone there, it is one or two persons. Does that sound frightening? What does that mean for labor? So I'm sounding like Orville Taylor now, Dr. Taylor. Because what it means is that originally you had a large amount of persons working in a factory, producing, making a product. But now, with technology, we saw a gradual reduction with technology. You need less people because you have better tools. So you get less people. And with the advent of information and communication technology, and technology generally, the Japanese showed you how you could actually reduce and use robotics to actually be making products. So you're using robots to make products. But now you are in the realm now of the artificial intelligence. We are now taking it to a serious degree that you really do not need so much people. And so there is even a concept out there um, that says you really don't need people to work anymore. What you really need to do is give people a universal pay, a universal salary, a universal pay. So keep you living, you get a universal pay, and the robots through artificial intelligence are doing the, the work. Sounds utopia. Some people might say it's dystopia. But, <clears throat> but that is where the, 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 the life is heading. Serious Star Trek. So you say to yourself, is face-to-face -face interaction important? So with the advent, where's my smartphone? I left it. With the advent of smartphone, the dynamics change because people are no longer having that face-to-face -face talk anymore. People go out on a date or just for fun. And people are sending information to each other via phone, not conversing with the language, right, with the mouth. And they're on the phone, and you say to yourself, are these people together? But yes, they are. So the social has been reduced because of the technology. The social is going to be reduced because of artificial intelligence. So times are changing. <clears throat> and it's a matter of what does the HR practitioner do in this scenario, in this situation? So we will see. So if you want to stay abreast with information like this, monitor a site named Flipboard. Flipboard. And you see where changes are happening within the world, within the area of technology, within the area of the workforce. So the workforce is changing. Right? <coughs> so I, I'm not certain if I answered you, answered you, but I just gave you Yes. Yeah. Yes. Moving leaps and bounds. Leaps and bounds in the other direction. Yes. Yes. Major, major challenge. I leave you with 
Minority Report, Tom Cruise. You know it? Interesting movie. Sci-fi, good stuff. I don't know if they were using predictive technology at the time, or it was just being able to see the future. But Minority Report, take a look at it. Questions? Yes. <laughs> yes. Negative in the economy? Yeah. Okay. They don't report it as negative. And they have a concern about the speed of the transformation of the country. Right. The question is, how do we eliminate the HR function first? Eliminate it? No, no, you are giving me, I think I spend too much time on CNN than on the local news. You are saying that they are going to eliminate. But, but I would find it a bit, a bit challenging. If I'd find it a bit challenging that they are going to eliminate the HR function. because, And the reason why I said that is that Wayne Jones, who is the Deputy Financial Secretary, he went to China, and they were looking at HR systems, and they're building a HRMS to integrate the public sector. So to eliminate, it seems, it, it seems to be counter to what I know that they're doing. So probably what they're doing is not eliminate, but reshaping. They're reshaping, reshaping the HR. Yes. No, no. What the HRMS would, would, would bring is rich data. So I, I, I would say that you can't eliminate. What you can do is reshape, reconfigure. Uh, and so you may need less individuals within HR. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Okay. Right. Right. So that's a different thing, right? Because No, but if you do that, you would still have to have residing within those disparate groups, some HR, but then you would have a centralized um, body that actually manages. So you need, listen, it's all about technology, you know. The more technology is it, is the less people. So there will be a contraction. So you, you can't eliminate HR because HR has to do with people. So until people stop working, in businesses, you still need HR, you know. So you can reduce the HR, reshape it, but to eliminate it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, man, there will be downsizing. More technology, less people. Yes.
<laughs> Neanderthal man stuff. Yes. yes. I'm wondering if I should ask any of my um, people to answer the question. Well, they are not looking at me. They are avoiding looking at me with eyeball. So uh, let, me, let me go at it. That's a challenge that we also had. Because many of the human resource management systems are pretty expensive. But the good thing is that with the improvement of technology, the evolution of technology, then costs reduce. And there are, the more players that you bring within a market space, the lower the cost. So you have now many vendors that are selling HR systems that are far cheaper than those big, um, long es established players. So we can call Bamboo, we can call Orange HRM. And they are cloud-based as well. So the cloud-based version is easier to implement than the on-premise system. And it is a software um, as a service. So you pay as you go. So rather than having this massive outlay in hardware and software, you let somebody somewhere take care of that for you. And all you need is a computer. And the computing power is residing in Ireland, in Africa, Timbuktu, wherever. Not in your place, not on your premises. And you're paying a monthly fee or an annual fee. And that is how we have sought to handle our challenge of getting an HR system rather than doing the massive outlay. Yes? Please, please help me now, man. You can't abandon me like that. The safety of the data, because that was a very important. Eh? The safety of the data. <coughs> she asked the question, the safety of the data. How safe is the data? Um, in the cloud, it's not very safe. I've never used it. So, however, let me put in a, a qualifier. So, data can be breached anywhere. Anywhere. As long as someone has creative energy, you, you can be hacked. So, whether it's on premise or and the only way you can't be hacked is if you have a computer not connected to anything. It doesn't even have a receiver, Wi-Fi, nothing. That's the only way that one can't be hacked. But as long as you connect it to something, right, it can be hacked. <clears throat> but one of the things that we did was to make sure, so we have a cloud-based system, but we made sure to get ICT involved. And ICT concern would be the security um, of the data, as you mentioned. So there are a lot of algorithms that vendors would utilize to reduce the possibility of a breach. I'm not saying it can't happen, but they exist, those algorithms, right? So that is one. The second thing is in terms of your data itself. They usually have a backup site. So data if the data has been housed in Texas, a backup site may be in Africa or Nigeria. So if something, if, if Texas gets flooded, as happened the other day, then, and the information is destroyed there, then there's a backup, right? So that's how the data is secured. Talk a little louder. Sell. Sell cat for timekeeping. 
Right. She can tell you. We have had that experience. Yes, we have had that experience. So we make sure that we pay on time. Like an on-time airline. Yes, yes. Because it's pay as you go. And there's no there's no human intervention. It's it's yes. Because there's no human intervention, you know, it's a computer running. And it has no emotion. None. It just knows it turns on and turns off. Yes. So yes, that's true. And we have had that experience. Yes. What, what has been happening, what has been put out in the news for a while is that millennials are very fickle and they are impatient and they are stuff like this and all other things, right? In terms of, you said that metrics, um, the analytics is a step up from the metrics. Right. So there would have been something existing already. And you said that survey captures the past. How do you use these surveys or these results from these two to ensure that whoever you're getting in, oh. whoever you're getting in is the right fit, or at least they will stay in to expand whatever you have, you have in store for them or to do whatever. Right. How do you, how do you mitigate against that, which is your long-term goal or your short-term goal for the interviewer, right. and their personal, their soft in whatever it is that they're bringing to the table. Right. So you remember we spoke of uh, Rene, you want to help me with that one? Speak, man. When we're doing our things, we, we um, employ persons are the potential recruits that have to go to psychometric tests for, um, for them to be eligible. So that helps in selecting the personality, you say, for the organization. Right. right. So, so Renee is on, on it. She's on point. So, there are a battery of tests that one can implement in actually uh, making a choice in people. So, the battery of tests involves um, various integrity tests, personality, sociometry, various things to actually help in making a decision, along with interviews and so on. Um, so you can know through psychometrics as to what the person you're looking for should be. But then if you look also at the Google People Analytics, where they derived what sort of behaviors they required for people to coexist because coexisting in an organization is important and what behaviors are required in organization A may not be exactly the same as organization B. So you have psychometrics, you have behaviors that are also important. So you train on those behaviors but you also recruit based on those behaviors. So your questioning, your behavioral interviews help in determining um, the behaviors, your assessment center that you set up, because assessment centers, we also use assessment center, where you have persons working within a group, and these persons are the persons who are actually um, applying for the job. And you are observing how they work together and so on. Yes? Because in terms of, all right, perfect example, 
the master blender lady that so, yeah, so it's both, it's both recruiting now and retention you're talking, yes, I'm talking about retention. retention because Jerry and Nephew must have did something or must be doing something to keep that lady here right. she would have been a commodity because she's working in even though she's in Jamaica she's working for Italy her palette so, is unique yes so I am thinking people must know of her people must try to head on her yes but how would you meet again because you have these persons who are high well i would call them high risk because they are hot commodities right. right and for somebody i don't think it would only be compensation or whatever but how would you no. keep somebody and, like and that's, that and, engaged and, that is, and that is what they have been talking about it's not just survey survey is important but there is also focus groups there is also in-depth interview. So you can actually speak with people and find out what exactly are their challenges um, that they're having. And I often remark that the HR practitioner needs to go beyond the workplace and to figure out what problems exist external to the workplace that is affecting how people work on the job to be able to help in resolving those problems so when a person comes to work, then they are engaged. So it's not just money, as you are saying, but it is the various um, approaches that you utilize to get information that you can help in keeping those persons. centralizing our shared service then you need HR technology HR MS across the public sector and you would also need resident in each department some form of HR person you know 
Because you would eliminate all persons. This is like the HR issue. Yeah. Because there are going to be repercussions before you can have that implementation. So I was just wondering as to what critical thinking went into that rationalized. Because centralized is, you know, we're going to have to centralize to reduce. Yes. But you have to do a change management intervention yes. before you can actually begin to yeah. centralize as yeah. something as critical as HR. Yeah, and I do know, I do know that they, they had advertised for change management consultants, because mm -hmm. I had seen that in the Sunday week. So I just wanted to yeah. it up as something in terms of the question, in terms of how does the HR use analytics and how is it impacting the analytics? Yes. And the consternation for this was how was that decision made if there was some analytics? Because statistics, you have to be careful when you're traveling. Because statistics, you have to be any picture that you want that they may be doing. But what I would say is that I am not aware of them having analytics. It would be more metrics. But that's where I'm going to. Not analytics. But that's where I'm going to also. Because what garbage in, garbage out in. And we all know that that is a downside of um, technology. And critical thinking, I mean, the, the, the artificial intelligence in programs is also designed by what you put into the program. So the platform and the approach you are using is a good approach because you're not badly towards you because the technology will right. change and we don't know if it's fine or fashion or here to stay. Right. But at least you can massage technology as you go along to impact the type of data that you want. Where the issue is is a critical thinking and the decision making, yes, that happens. But how do we transfer that? Transfer that into an organization, not our machines, but our people at the end of the day. Because there is also motivation that will take place. Right. As, as you know, the behavioral factors, the results are easy to identify. It's a behavior that create the problems at the end of the day. So, you know, how do we create that balance in using the analytics? Because we can make decisions, what the consequences of decisions. And that's why at one uh, that's why at one point in the presentation I told you that HR must not seed C E D E its responsibility <laughs> to finance and IT. They must take up the mantle of HR analytics and not allow other entities to actually run HR analytics. Is that um, the lady with the firepower? Thank you. 